Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you all for coming, or for not coming, but tuning in, I guess <laughs> is the proper term. Our speaker tonight is well known to everybody here, I think, Jay Sokolow, Dr. Jay Sokolow, who is a radiologist um, and a past president of the New Haven County Medical Association. He's also a past president of Becky, more, probably more importantly to us. Um, <laughs> And um, I, you know, I realized I don't know how you came to be such an, uh, a text expert, whether it was just personal yeah, interest sure. or study. So maybe you'll tell us a little bit when you start about that. I, I, so I have no credentials or specifics, but I do know, having studied with you before, that you know an awful lot. And it's always a pleasure to learn with you. And I always, we always learn new things. Tonight, Jay is going to talk about the practice of Chespon Hanefesh which means taking a moral inventory. Um, and he's gonna compare our sages and our texts, our ancient texts with the uh, texts of the 12-step uh, programs. And I had a chance to look at them a little bit beforehand and I have to say I was quite impressed at some of the similarities. Um, I did not expect that. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about that. So everybody here is Dr. Jay Sokolow. Thank you, and I'm not going to thank you for that introduction. I'm not going to go into where I've learned what I've learned. We could talk about that some other time. Let's just get to the business because there's a lot to talk about. So um, I took the title of the talk from this book, Cheshbon HaNefesh, which was written in 1812 by Rabbi Mendel Santanov. He was uh, from uh, what's now Ukraine. He wrote a lot of Yiddish translations of traditional Jewish material to popularize it. And he also wrote this book, which is an early work of what's called Musar, which is sort of guiding people on the right path. So cheshbon, uh, uh, the word Hebrew word cheshbon is a common word. If you've been in a restaurant in Israel and you ask for the check, you probably said, pay me a cheshbon or cheshbon bubak. It just means adding up or taking, or taking stock of or tallying. And a nefesh, and nefesh is the soul. So it, the literal translation is, is taking a, an accounting of where we are. But Rabbi Mendel of Santana really is not talking about just taking an accounting. He's also talking about um, how to use that as a way to improve our characters. And especially around the high holidays, the idea of of improving uh, who we are and trying to um, do things a little differently, I think are, is on everybody's mind. And I, I bring up the 12 steps of AA. I'm gonna get that up here for you next. Um, because there's a great similarity uh, between the, um, I don't know if I, you don't see the, all of them when you scroll, huh? Oh, you can scroll your own page. It's okay. Um, because I'm looking also on Ina's computer to see how it looks for you guys. It's a little confusing. Anyway. Jay, you, uh, you have to be the one to scroll it. To scroll. We can't scroll it. I have it. to scroll. Okay. So I got to get to the, okay. Um, I, I really should train more for this. Okay. So the reason I, I think for a lot of us, actually, the 12-step approach for, or in the popular culture, 12-step approach to moral improvement may be a little bit more familiar. So I'm going to start with that as sort of a basic introduction. And if, it, if you're not familiar with it, I'm going to run through it pretty quickly, but I think you're going to get a sense of, of what this means. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous were formulated in 1939, the publication of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, written by Bill W. with the help of the first hundred white men who were in sobriety. They were all white men at that time, mostly in the New York area and Akron, Ohio. And um, the roots of AA came out of the Oxford group, which was a Christian group that had also studied the idea of moral improvement or personal improvement. And um, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, who were the founders of AA in 1935, tried to use those principles as a way to help people in, to achieve sobriety. People have been, at that point, really uh, chronic and hopeless alcoholics. 
and they felt by transforming themselves into better people, they could uh, affect sobriety. And as we know, AA has been very popular and, and the steps have been used in all sorts of other settings and I think uh, very effectively. But it has the same sort of basis. So we're going to look first at step four, made of searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So after the first three steps, which deal with admitting they can't drink anymore, coming to believe that a power grade themselves could help restore them sanity, and then uh, making a declaration that they will try to turn their lives over to God as they understand God, um, we get to the point of a searching and forest moral inventory. And in the early AA literature, that focuses on interpersonal relationships. So the way it's laid out is to say, um, who do I have a resentment at? Why do I worry about it? For example, I have a resentment at my boss. Why? Well, because I stole from them and I feel guilty about it. He might fire me, so I have financial insecurity. And at the root of that is fear. Um, so in that way, by going through relationships, they tried to guide people towards understanding what was underlying their, uh, their behavior and their feelings. And then having done that inventory, then the next step is to share that with another person and with God so that um, somebody is there to give feedback and to check on it. That's step five. Out of that, they come to realize that they have defects of character, things that have plagued them in some way. And um, they try to have those character defects removed by asking God to help them. They have to become ready to remove the character defects and then have them removed. That's a lot of what um, Rabbi Mendel's work is about, is how to remove character defects. So that's what we're going to talk about in more detail when we get to his program. Step eight and nine are about making amends to people and writing relationships. That's not particularly part of the Cheshbon Nefesh work. Certainly it's a big part of the high holidays and we, and we make amends to each other, but that's not um, part of the moral inventory per se. And then step 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. So it becomes, while well, the, the, the Fearless moral inventory and admitting the wrongs to somebody else may be something that you would do at the beginning of sobriety or maybe periodically. Doing the daily inventory is something that would happen um, frequently, you know, every day or maybe even more often whenever a situation comes up to stop and see what's my part in it, what can I do about it, where did I go wrong, uh, where did I go right. Um, so that's that's sort of a basic overview of that approach. Um, and I think maybe I'll stop here for a minute just to see if anybody has any questions that they want clarified before we move on to talking about the next uh, work, which is the Cheshbon and Nefesh book. Any Nobody has sent anything to me. Does anybody have something now? Mm. I don't see that. Nope. Okay. Keep going. All right. So now we should be, let me see. I'm going to turn the, can you turn it around so I can see what we have there? Um, good. Okay. Um, now we're going to look at the, these are all available if you want to keep them. And I'm going to explain the procedure that uh, was laid out in 1812 in this book. What he's talking about is first, getting an inventory and seeing where you fall short a little bit or what kind of traits you would like, maybe a better way to look at it is what kind of traits would you like to enhance? And this is a list of 13 that he uses that as an example in the book, but he makes it clear where you would like everybody to personalize that. In other words, go through the literature about moral improvement, come up with the things that speak to you the, best, the most, and then make a list of 13 traits. The reason he wants 13 is he'd like you to be able to do this cycle um, of a 13 week cycle four times a year, right? And the, um, you'll, you'll have in the downloaded material a description of the procedure. So I'm not gonna read that to you, but basically the idea is this. Every day, if for one week, 
out of the 13 should pick one particular thing that you would like to um, improve. So let's, for example, take the attribute of silence. Um, you also have, I'm going to, I'm going to um, just read for you. There's another sheet that has further descriptions of all of these different traits and key phrases, but I'm just going to read the one for silence as an example. So, shtika, silence. Before you open your mouth, be silent and reflect. What benefit will my speech bring me or others? Okay. So, say that's the, the, what we're working on for this week. So, every morning, we would say, um, what situations are coming up where maybe it would behoove me to be silent? Am I going to go to a meeting with people who may be more learned than I, and I might learn more by keeping quiet than speaking? Am I interacting with relatives who might be difficult, or would it be better if I stopped and considered my words before I blurted out something? Am I going to be in a situation um, where I have to tell somebody something difficult? Um, you know, am I going to remember to take pauses long enough to see their reaction rather than just blurt out a, a flurry of words? So that's going to be my task for the day, not neglecting any of the other traits, but focusing on that one for this week. At the end of the day, I'm going to sit down and go through this checklist for all of the different traits and say, how did I, did I have situations today where these traits were not upheld to the level that I would like to see? And I'm going to give myself a mark, a check, you know, like today I, I, I lost my, uh, my, equanimity twice, I got very upset at something. Or today I um, was not as zealous as I should have been about uh, you know, studying. Or go through and, and check it off. And then at the end of that week, I'm gonna tally up and say, how did I do this week? And then the next day, I'm, the next week, I'm gonna pick the next trait to concentrate on, to think in the morning and focus about how am I gonna improve that trait? And then at the end of the day, again, go through and check it off. And this is a cycle that he recommends repeating um, four times a year. And each time at the end of the cycle, tallying up and seeing how I did and keeping track as an inventory, a real inventory. You know, am I improving in this task? Am I getting better about um, this trait that I want to improve? And if I'm not getting better there, what do I have to do to make it more intense? Maybe I have to take on a practice that's going to intensify it. So let me just go through, um, let me stop there for a second, just to see if the procedure is clear to people. Is there any, are there any questions about procedure or comments about it that somebody wants to bring up? I'm happy to, small group, so we can be kind of free about this. If there are any, so far so good? All right, well, why don't we look at some of the particular um, traits, which I think are kind of interesting. And uh, let's see, you should have now, I gotta, I gotta go back and share, hold on. Okay, good. All right, so as I said, he has, in this book, um, I can just show you maybe a, a sample page and if people could see, but there's chapters on each of these traits. And I've only summarized sort of the, the phrase that's supposed to remind you of all the things you've learned and studied by studying these traits and to see how to internalize them. Um, so this is not meant to be the whole picture. It's meant to remind you of what you've learned when you decided to pick these traits as the one you want to work on. Um, as I say, these are the ones that he's selected, but there are others. There are alternative ones that are suggested in the book and also you know, anything that particularly speaks to you. But I think the ones that he selected are kind of interesting. And I found some of them spoke to me a lot. So the very first one, is menuchat ha-nefesh. Equanimity is the English translation that they use. Menucha means rest, like on Shabbat, menucha, nefesh, your soul. So it's having a restful soul. Um, 
And the, the phrase that he suggests sort of imprinting for that is rise above events that are inconsequential, both bad and good, for they are not with, worth disturbing your equanimity. Very Zen kind of approach, I guess, but you know, back from the 18th century. Um, and I know for me, I, it's, it's when I remember to do that and to try to remain sort of calm in the face of adversity, uh, I think by nature, I actually am pretty good at that. But nonetheless, it's something that has been very helpful for me to sort of keep that um, control. Not control. It's um, it's balance. It, 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 balance. You know, it, in his description, he says it comes from clinging to the higher power. So, so uh, uh, this is a very religious book. Keshbon Nefesh, Obviously, he's you know writing for a Jewish audience, a re, uh, observant Jewish audience, and he talks a lot about the separation of the animal soul from the divine soul. And a lot of these traits that disturb us, he, he identifies as coming from the animal uh, instincts. And that the divine soul, while not separate from it, is meant to counterbalance these instincts. So, you know, we, we might think of it in modern terms as sort of the limbic system and the higher cognitive function, Morris, right? <laughs> you know, that we have, um, that, that we have this, uh, rush of adrenaline in certain situations that goes back to a very primitive brain, but our equanimity can come from our higher cognitive functions tapping that down and remaining calm in the face of this sort of impulsive urge that is is also there. Um, or if you like to put it in different terms, you can say it's sort of the the divine nature of our soul ruling over the animal nature of our body. Um, I mean, I mean, it sounds like a little too much conflict, but I think that is kind of the way that um, the rabbi, Rabbi Mendel would, would couch that term. So, so that's one of, the, one of the ones. And the way I would do this in practice is the week that I'm working on equanimity, I would sit in the morning and try to plan out when this might really need to be something that I would have to pay attention to in my upcoming day. And then at the end of the day, take stock of this as well as all the other uh, things and see how I did in different situations. Um, the next one is a related one, sablanut, patience. Um, but I, I actually, we, I had a, a concept of what patience is, but I love the way he describes it. He says, when something bad happens and you do not have the power to avoid it, do not aggravate the situation even more through wasted grief. And it's such a, I, I just love that formulation. It's not, it's not only patience waiting, it's just not to, not to make things worse by, by putting our own energy into a situation, having it bounce back at us. So, the next one, um, Seder, order, that's, that's one of the things I really need to work on in my personal life, that all your actions and preparation should be orderly in a set place and at a set time, which allows your thoughts to be free to deal with what is ahead of you. I'm, I'm a clutterer, I'm not good at that. So that's one of the, one of the things that you know, I need to be working on. Charitzut, um, decisiveness, that, all actions should be preceded by deliberation, but once you've reached a decision, act without hesitation. And I think that's um, that's a, you know another sort of these are the this could be retitled as the twelve tips for a successful life or something, but this goes back uh, before that kind of a pop culture. It just shows that basically we're still looking for the same kinds of advice as, as he was trying to give. Um, Nikayon, cleanliness, very straightforward, maybe more of an issue in the 18th and 19th centuries than it is now, but um, keep your clothes clean, keep your body clean, keep your space clean. Um, 
you say it might be one that I might take off my list because I don't think well maybe maybe I shouldn't say that I don't have an issue with that I'd have to ask you folks but <laughs> um, you know I, I might I might put in a different trait that I think would be more profitable for me to work on Anava humility uh, seek to learn from everyone recognize your failings and correct them stop thinking about your virtues and your friends faults um, this is also, by the way, a very uh, big step in in AA. I'm not going to repost it, but when we were in, in the 12 steps, um, I just want to quote it correctly. When we're talking about when when they're talking about asking God to remove shortcomings, step seven says humbly ask Him to remove our shortcomings and. And that sense of humility is very um, is uh, stressed in the AA program, and the the opposite the way that it's often defined in AA is the opposite of humility is not pride. The opposite of humility is self-centeredness. So thinking about others, not not being so wrapped up in ourselves is um, is the essence of humility. Um, the way he puts it is, stop thinking about your virtues and your friends' faults. But you know, not to not to be so uh, self-absorbed. Um, tzedek, righteousness. What's hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That's Rabbi Akiva's famous uh, summary of the entire Torah: to to treat everybody fairly. Um, kimutz, frugality, uh, be careful with your money, spend wisely. That's, um, that's interesting. I, 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 um, uh, I guess I could say the same. When I, when, when my, when my kids were little and we drive around and I see somebody with uh, a car that cost more than my house, I would always say to them, that person should have a bumper sticker that says my values are screwed up. And, and, you know, I, I don't like to judge other people with that, but I have to judge myself with that too. My money has a lot of power to do good in the world. And I have to be, I, I have a right to use it for myself, but I also have responsibility to use it for others. And I have, and that's a balance. So frugality, uh, diligence, not to allow a moment of life to be wasted. Always find something to do to benefit yourself or someone else. Um, Shtika, silence. We talked. To, I, that was the first one I chose to because I'm, I have to talk all night here, so <laughs> I should probably pay attention to this one. But be, be silent and reflect before you before you speak. What benefit will my speech bring me or others? Uh, nihuta, calmness. Um, the words of the wise are stated gently. In being good, do not be called evil. That comes from from uh, Mishle, from Proverbs, and I, and I love that. And uh, people, um, you know, the anger young man kind of thing, where uh, you can be very righteous but not do it in a gentle way. That's not that's not the right way to behave. Um, emet, uh, not to say anything that you're not certain is completely true. Not to, that's very different from speaking not speaking falsehoods, but. This is this is also referring to main, making sure that you've got your facts straight before sharing them. And if you're not sure, keep your mouth shut. Um, Pre-shoot, separation, which is talking about um, sexual morality in the 18th century, you know, keeping away from lewd thoughts, uh, having proper intent with conjugal relations. And then there's a list of ones that you might want to um, substitute for one of those. Maybe during the year you find that one particular trait, you've got an, no check marks that show that you failed in that. So you might say, okay, I have this one down pretty well. Let me try something else. Uh, temperance, before eating or drinking, consider what benefit this has to your health or what mitzvah fulfills. Deliberation, yeah. not being hasty. Pause while speaking. Um, modesty, uh, bitachon, trust. This is a 
big one for me. It's if worry comes to you, take it as a warning from God who loves you. Examine your deeds and take counsel. I always say, I, I as much as I feel that I'm I'm religious and and I'm ritual, I don't really have a, a firm trust in God yet. Even though I read about it all the time, I I think I really need to improve that. Um, the devote generosity. So these are some of the examples. Um, you know, in the packet that you download, it has a greater explanation of the procedure. It has the checklist. And, you know, I'd like to now, I think, open it up to sort of a discussion. Uh, maybe people can, I hope we can have a little discussion about how you use these tools or other types of tools to sort of see where you are in life and, and where you want to be. Um, so let me, let me stop for a bit and see if people are willing to share a bit. Um, and by the way, if somebody has something that they would rather not have shared, recorded, we can you can just tell Daryl at the beginning she can pause the recording if if what you're saying is something private that you'd rather not have on the website. Okay. So, um, our first comment, I think it's a comment, or hmm? or a question from David. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, actually, I have a, a question, which is in your reading of Rabbi Mendel's work, what would you say he is saying is the goal of all of this effort? Is this self-improvement for the sake of self-improvement? Is this you need to improve yourself because that makes you a more effective member of a community in a relationship with God. Is it both? What would you take from what you've read as to what, what Rabbi Mendel is saying as the reason for doing this? Okay. Actually, I mean, I, that's a great, a great question, David. And, and he explains it pretty fully in the book in the beginning before he gets to the procedure. And it's similar to some of the other works of the time, like the Tanya um, of Kassidu, where they're, they're, they're talking about the nature of human beings and the nature of human beings as being um, a mixture of a divine and animal soul. And the work of, um, maybe to put it in a more modern idiom, it's like we're, we're not... Um, we're spiritual, we're human beings try to become more spiritual, or maybe we're spiritual beings try to learn how to be human. Um, that our, that our essence of nature is a mix of this divine spirit and the animal uh, body, and that our goal is to come closer and closer to the divine spirit. Not by hurting the animal body in any way, but by conquering the sort of uh, base instincts and to become more perfected with a cleaving to God. So I think a lot of what he's seeing, what he's talking about is really that all of these traits um, help us to get closer to God by clearing away some of the distractions. I think that's sort of the, the heart of it. Um, so the, the definite goal is not interpersonal relationships as much as it is really getting to be particularly close to God. And the, one of the th ways that's accomplished is by treating other people well. And by the way, AA also, I mean, the, in, the, in the preamble to the 12 steps, it says these 12 steps are suggested as a program of recovery. The, the goal is to get people to stay sober. That's the, the only goal. But in order to do that, um, Bill Wilson believed that one had to improve their character, that the person who was still cheating and lying and, and stealing would not be able to stay sober. They could not not drink if they didn't have good self-esteem, if they continued to harm other people, if they felt guilt and shame. So the the essence, the purpose of the 12 steps is only to maintain sobriety, but in order to do that, you have to become a better person. And I think that's also you know, sort of the, uh, there's a lot in common in these spiritual traditions of all kinds. 
the the the, um, the self improvement really is about um, getting to be where we want to be, whatever that goal is. But but for for the rabbi, it's getting close to God, and for uh, Bill Wilson, it was to stay sober. So, but what do you think? Um, no, my question following that is that. How does this interplay possibly with a viewpoint on Kabbalah in terms of a way of getting closer to God? And did a lot of people see this as complementary, uh, conflicting with that uh, as, as a way to get closer to God? So I'm not an expert on Kabbalah yet. <laughs> but... Um... I, I think this this comes more from the Hasidut, early Hasidut movement and the Musar movement of uh, well, this is very early in, in the in the Musar movement. I, it's this comes not so much from the um, esoteric as the more practical part of Judaism, I guess. So you know, Kabbalah might might talk about some arcane rituals or prayers that help to connect one to God. This has a lot more to do with the personal feelings, internal uh, view of oneself and interactions with others. A much more basic and down to earth kind of philosophy, I think. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I think Morris had a question. Uh, thanks, Jay, for presenting this. Uh, I, I was unaware there were popular self-help books back then. This is uh, really lovely. Yeah. Uh, so, so as you well know, 12 steps depends upon a fellowship. Mm -hmm. and it depends upon uh, not doing this by yourself, to have the sponsor to be able to, to go to meetings where you can listen to the stories of others who are trying to do this, what their struggles have been, and uh, what they have done uh, in the direction of recovery. And those are inspirational and very important, particularly for beginners, as you know. And uh, the, uh, the danger of a, of a list of traits that one should improve on is that it can play into uh, individual scrupulosity, which is all too common in our, in our religious communities, uh, in which uh, one is tormented by the, uh, torments oneself in the belief that that is how one attains uh, uh, improvement. Uh, it's not a happy path. And uh, so I'd, I'd be interested to know whether there's anything in this approach which uh, parallels the idea of a mentor, of fellowship, of, of uh, tempering the, the self-criticism uh, with the, the need to be uh, self-accepting and kind. Now, I noticed that the word kind never appears in this list. <laughs> <laughs> it could. It's not one of the ones that he selected, but yes. Um, so I, I didn't copy the whole book for you, but um, I'm going to read now from, from his procedure chapter 40, uh, part 44. He says, we previously explained that this discipline is best undertaken in partnership with someone else. This is surely true of a husband and wife whose cooperation is with all their hearts with all their souls and with all their might. One's wife can provide him with the most severe and continuous testing of his improvement, a test that cannot be escaped or ignored as long as one lives. So for the, that's one suggestion he makes to, to do this with family. He also talks about using it as an educational tool for children um, and and you know, and also having a rabbi and a spiritual uh, mentor. But I was actually very touched that he, um, you know, pointed out as a family activity. And I think that could be very. I, you, you're definitely right, Morris. I mean, any any tool, any tool, no matter how well intentioned, can be used in a bad way. 
Um, and I could certainly see where somebody could use this who's a depressive nature to beat themselves up or, and, 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 you know, has to be uh, attempted with, um, well, with a, with a kind of self-love that's important, right? Somebody has to have that sense that they're important enough to try to improve. But I think he does highly recommend doing it in concert with, uh, you know, a loved one as a way to, to try to, I hope, I think he means to temper that, but um, that's what's in that book. But, it, you know, all of these things, I, I don't mean to um, preach that somebody should use this particular set of, any of these set of tools, but I think the concept is, is, is there in Judaism, it's there in the, in the greater world and its benefit is really is intense if people really can um, even, you know, make a start of it. There is a humility in the, the public confessional that, that, that we go through, uh, through the holidays that, um, that acknowledges our common human experience of, of uh, needing to improve, of recognizing our failures. And to some extent, there is a fellowship in that, but it is, of, of course, uh, ritualized. It's not individualized. And um, uh, there, um, and, you know, I, I find our show wonderfully accepting of the varieties of people that we have. It's one of the great joys of, of attending uh, Shoal is not just the, the um, uh, not just the uplifting part, but the acceptance of all our, uh, of each other for who we are. It's, uh, I think that's quite beautiful. Um, and um, in this, in this uh, proposed approach, I don't hear any, I mean, it's great if you got a wife that those criticisms you can hear as uplifting, but, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, there doesn't seem to be uh, any emphasis on, on fellowship. I wonder if you have a comment on that. Well, uh, yeah, I guess my comment is certainly in the in the AA program, there's much more emphasis on fellowship. Um, you know, this is one particular author. There are others like um, Rabbi Shapiro is the, the uh, not Shapiro, the, the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto, who um, wrote a student's obligation and some other great works. Uh, his focus is entirely on, on creating groups of Hasidim who would work together to elevate themselves. Of course, that was all male, but but nonetheless, you know, there was a there was a great emphasis in the in his circles in the early 20th century before he was murdered by the Nazis about exactly what you're talking about, having fellowships to uh, encourage each other and to spur on spiritual growth. You know, and I think um, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the High Holiday piece because you know we're doing this as part of the High Holiday series. I think what one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is because I think we focus a little bit too much on the few days of ritual and not enough on the continuous practice of improvement. You know, we talk about it in medicine all the time now, continuous uh, improvement rather than trying to make, uh, you know, big changes, but to always be looking at ways we can do things a little bit better. And I think that also works in a spiritual way to try to always way to do something a little bit better rather than relying solely on a few days of intense activity in that sphere. So, but, uh. Thank you. I, um, I have a quick comment, which was relative to something you just said, which um, I was thinking about Morris's comment um, about the humility of doing it together as community and thinking, yes, except it's not temporalized. It doesn't continue, or rather it is, for the high holidays, temporalized. It's, it's set in a particular time where the, I guess the advantage of that is you can um, look forward to it or return to it. Um, it's not on you as a 
burden if that's the way you choose it all the time. And yet um, this particular regimen of doing it on an ongoing basis, which is much more like a 12 step program, um, feels like it's more of an evolution of a person rather than an accounting at a specific point in time at any particular, in other words, it's an ongoing accounting of oneself rather than a periodic accounting of oneself. Um, our next comment uh, or question actually was from Karen Kassop actually relates to something that you started talking about, which was the fellowship and et cetera, but I'll let her ask it herself, Karen. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I feel like Morris really touched on the thing that I was thinking about, which was about going through these steps alone and whether, what our ability is to be um, both self-loving and critical and to really understand the depth of the definitions and the meaning. So um, I guess I was just going to ask you what you think the rabbi's intention was when he wrote this. And then I, um, whether there's a way, you know, we're talking about ritual and the high holidays and like the emotional and spiritual preparation that we may or may not take how much time we spend maybe in a lul or not like thinking that it's coming but if there's a way to include this in like the daily rituals if there's a way to incorporate this so that like if we do have some sort of daily to feel like that we participate in that we can um bring it to use so that was two questions one i was kind of like tagging along with what Morris said because that was really what i was thinking working on this alone can be really hard. And it's not just hurting yourself, it's also like letting yourself off or not even fully mm -hmm. understanding where you could go with some of the ideas. That, and then also the other thing was, is there some way or suggestion to include this in daily life or prayer? Wow. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, there are groups of sacred communities where people try to do this kind of work together. And, you know, I, I think Becky could be one of those places um, where we could have a fellowship of people who are interested in self-improvement and check in with each other on a regular basis. I, you know, maybe this is the nucleus for it. I don't know. I think, I think that is doable. I think it's laudable and I think it's practical. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, Gadiel actually typed a comment that he said he was fine to have me share with the group, which was that he had always heard of Musar as the non-Hasidic version, parallel to the Hasidic focus on the spiritual development of, of Hasid. Um, both share a modernist focus on the individual and interiority. Mm -hmm. Do you want to... Uh, Adiel, yeah, do you no, want to expand on that or? Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, I was going to say, I think that, that I think he's, he's right. It's just that uh, Cheshman and Nefesh was published early, 1812. You know, Cassidus really started not that long before that, um, mid, mid 18th century. So, uh, and it has the approbation when it was republished in 1845 of uh, Rabbi uh, Solanter, who was one of the first Musar movement people. So I think this is a crossover kind of work. I think it's certainly influenced by the Hasidic uh, movement early on, but it was, but this approach is embraced by the Musar movement. So, you know, it, I think it may be just a time period. And later on, I think, it, as Gadiel said, it did split more into Musar being accepted in the uh, the world, the people who were opposed to Hasidus, while Hasidus developed its own sort of same approach to things uh, within Hasidus. But the principles are the same. You know, Self-improvement, working together with others and, and trying to, to be better human beings, better Jews. It's not, uh, it's, nobody has a monopoly on that. 
Thanks. Uh, anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, Jay, I was thinking, you know, now that you've explained that these steps to a better selves you know, would give our, us a calmness, you know, so that we would have time um, to really have an appreciation for uh, Hashem and, you know, uh, improve our lives. Before I knew that, and you were just reading through the steps, to me, it seemed so apropos right now with so much noise and anxiety with the pandemic uh, politics, which these steps should be really shared with our politicians, but to say the least. <laughs> yeah. um, but even when I was spent time with Margie today and she was saying to me, well, you shouldn't worry about this and you shouldn't wor worry about that. Try to empty your head a little bit. And that's a friend trying to help through these days. Those 12 steps, and I'm, I don't think I'm addicted to anything. Maybe it's worry. <laughs> Would just, for my life, seemed so apropos for today, let alone the fact that we've got the high holidays in such an unusual way. So it was just wonderful and something to really think about um, and appreciate. Thanks. The timing uh, is just excellent to cut folk yeah. like that now. Yeah, it's, I, mean, it's, I know exactly what you're saying. It's, it's, we're so distracted nowadays by all the bad news and all the things going on that we can forget that we have a, a holy soul and, and an important and more important than our own right and, and it's it's fair and reasonable to spend the time to take care of ourselves and to you know we have an obligation to the world but we have an obligation to ourselves too and it has to balance uh, that's easy to get distracted nowadays yeah, yeah very timely thank you <laughs> Okay, I think, uh, anybody else? Okay, Shoshana. Sorry. Can I just... Oh, sorry. here, Karen. No, is it all right if I'm speaking out? Of course. <laughs> um, what Jesse just said about self-care, I feel like that's so important and not necessarily obvious in like a list like this of self-improvement, but to use that word self-care that by going through a list like this and, and thinking about how you're interacting with yourself and other people is a way of helping you manage through really difficult times and not so difficult times. So I, I thought that was, I just wanted to get, say yes. Yes, Jesse, I agree. Well, and I'd like to make a comment about that. Both of you made me think, you know, we talk a lot in our culture about self care which obviously is important, but the thing that's different about both of these lists is that it's not just about oneself. It involves caring for yourself by being in relationship to God and to others, which is often very hard to remember. And like what you just said, Jay, we, to remember that we have a holy soul. How many times during the day do you say to yourself, it's good, I have a holy soul, so I'm just gonna take a deep breath and I'm in a relationship with God. I don't know about you, but it's almost never for me. Yeah. You know, mostly it's all of the things that are coming at me and I'm just trying to figure out how to deal with it. So it, this is a really nice, um, it's a way of thinking about it that incorporates care of self, but not to the point where you're just gazing inward only. Um, it's yourself in, in the world and in your, in your spiritual life as well. So I, I found it very interesting. Way of yeah, I just, just this week, I heard somebody sum it up in such a cute way. They said, God has a picture of me on his refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, so, that I matter right. to the creator. As, you know, right. It's like, wow, what a, what a lovely idea. You know? Well, that was one of the things we talked about with Robin a couple of weeks ago in her meditation session where she brought up that, you know, that you matter to God. And it was like a light went off in my head yeah. because I never thought about that. You know, and if you can hold that in your heart, that takes you a long way. Yeah, it's a very powerful. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. Anybody else have anything they want to say? I just want to mention um, our next talk will be um, on Thursday, September 24th. So between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, Jennifer Klein, who's a Becky member and a professor of American history at Yale, she's going to talk about repentance and teshuva as they pertain to racial inequities in the care of our elderly and disabled, specifically the women and men, often people of color, who provide that care. Um, she's an expert in this field. She's written a book about home, you know, caring for the elders and disabled in our community. And I think it's going to be a very interesting talk and thought provoking and about some of these issues of teshuva and, you know, atonement and just, again, another perspective for us to think about ourselves and our community. So I hope you'll join us then. And I'd like to wish everyone a Shana Tova, like no other, whatever. We'll have lots of stories to tell um, after this is over, but uh, I hope it, it is a sweet, sweet time for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Jay. Yes, Thank I'm you, going everybody. Jay, very much. I am going to repost the um, link to the materials that Jay used right. during his session so that if people want to access them now that they've actually seen them, uh, you can do that easily. And just a reminder, if anybody has access to any N95 masks that we can access tomorrow early, um, that would be really appreciated. Um, Shana Tova, everybody.